All right. Hi, everyone. If you're watching this video, it's likely you're looking for information about puberty blockers, something that has come up in media quite a lot recently. Now, the High Court has ruled that children under 16 who say they want to change gender are unlikely to be able to give their informed consent to treatment with drugs that block puberty. Maybe you're a child looking for information about puberty blockers. Maybe you're a parent that is looking about whether or not puberty blockers are safe or not. Either way, you're in the right place. Today's video is a bit different than the usual. Typically, my videos aren't aimed at children, although you're more than welcome to watch, but this video is more aimed towards parents. But this one is about children as a category and how we, as adults, relate to them, especially when it comes to medicine. And so if this is the first time you're watching a video of mine, hello, my name is Mia Mulder, and today, we're going to talk about puberty blockers. But before we get to that, let's go into basics. You see, there's this thing called puberty that can afflict your child. Now, puberty is, for the most part, a completely normal and healthy part of a child's development. It happens to pretty much everyone, but there are some complications. Sometimes puberty can be difficult. For example, sometimes a child can be trans and Developing secondary sexual characteristics that don't align with how they identify can be troubling. But oftentimes, a lot of children feel uncomfortable by the fact that puberty is happening to them. And that's normal. A boy's voice might drop and become lower. Girls might develop breast tissue. And this can be scary. Sometimes with reasons that do have to do with gender identity, such as transgender children, but oftentimes not. Puberty is scary for everyone. And I do want to preface it by saying that some kids who do exhibit some discomfort in their puberty grow out of it. Not everyone ends up being trans after puberty, and that is fine. Others, however, won't, and will want to transition to live as the gender that they identify as, including physically. And that is where puberty blockers come in. Now, on the surface, it may seem like a very easy issue here. You take a medicine, you don't have your puberty, and that's basically it. These medicines do as the name says. They slow the onset of puberty, as well as reduce the effect that puberty is having on your body. And this can obviously be very helpful if you want to transition later in life, because you won't have to undo a puberty that you didn't want anyway. Seems pretty easy. Right? But there's been some controversy here. Um, what about comparing people in the trans debate to speaking out against Nazis? I mean, that's pretty extreme. Well, there's a couple of parallels. If you paid attention to trans youth media recently, you may be aware that a lot of medical practitioners and some governments are heavily arguing against puberty blockers as a type of medicine, arguing that children should not be given them. Which might make you think, oh no, what has happened? Has a study come out and said that puberty blockers will harm our children? It's a bit more complicated. The issue that we're dealing with is twofold. One, are puberty blockers safe? And second, does it matter? And that second point is something that I'm gonna come back to a bit later. But you're here for the science, the cold hard facts. Are puberty blockers safe? After all, that's all that matters, right? Who cares about the politics of it all? We should just be sure that we're giving our children medicines that are safe, that are practical. And we should do this with the least amount of risk possible. And that is something I think everyone can agree on. So let's quickly talk about what puberty blockers are. So when we're talking about puberty blockers, we need to define what exactly it is we're talking about. The pure scientific stuff. But I want to preface this by saying that I'm not a doctor. I'm a historian by education and a YouTuber by trade. So take what I'm saying here with a pinch of salt. You should always be critical of the media you consume. Puberty blockers are a type of medicine that are called gonad gonadotropin, gonadotropin releasing hormone agonist. The chemical process behind these medicines are very easy. 
GnRH agonists act as agonists of the GnRH receptor, the biological target of gonadotropin releasing hormone, the amyl GnHR. These drugs are called GnRH receptor downregulated The way it works, very basically, is by inhibiting sexual hormones from being released. And they exist under many different brand names. But the one you're most likely to encounter is probably a brand name called Lupron. These medicines can be applied in two instances, either prescribed by doctors at gender identity clinics who see that a puberty blocker would be beneficial for the child, that they would find some use out of it, or that they would find some comfort in having more time to think about their gender identity before deciding whether or not they are trans or not. They can also be given out as part of informed consent, where children can be informed of the risks and decide for themselves whether or not they want to accept it. But that takes an emotional maturity, and that is a subject that I'm also going to be tackling a bit later. These medicines are prescribed to children who suffer from a discomfort relating to puberty. Studies have shown that this helps children feel more at ease in their bodies and reduces levels of depression and anxiety, even in cases where children don't end up being trans. Typically, these medicines come in two forms. One is an injectable, and the other is an implant. The injectable medicine can be injected once a month, once every three months, or even longer. The implant, however, is something that you put in your arm, and it slowly releases the medicine over the course of an entire year. This medication works by blocking the release of sex hormones. Things like testosterone, estrogen, progesterone. And that is what, in essence, prevents puberty from occurring. Because if you remember your middle school biology, puberty is sort of driven by these hormones. So far, so good. But here's where we reach our first point of common misunderstanding. These medications weren't developed for this purpose. They weren't developed for trans youth in the first place at all. And this medication can be used for a multitude of other health issues as well, because what they are designed to do can have multiple effects, depending on whatever health issue you have. Another common application of this medicine is also in young cis girls. Girls who have undergone puberty a bit too soon, which can have adverse effects on your body and your health. These medicines then slow that down and let young girls get into puberty in a bit more typical pace. That's because puberty isn't the same for everyone. Oftentimes, young girls will begin their puberty earlier than is typical, sometimes as young as five years old or younger, which obviously is a bit quick and can have multiple health risks associated with it. Puberty blockers work the same way here, by suppressing the hormone that triggers puberty, until such a point as the child is ready, typically at around age 11 or 12. It's still a puberty blocker, but not for any fancy pants transgender reason. And I think that's important, because these are not trans medicines. This is just normal medicine. But because these medicines restrict the release of hormones, they are also used in other health conditions where hormones are important, such as breast cancer, endometriosis, prostate cancer. And that last part can sound scary sometimes. You're not seriously trying to say that children going to the doctor and saying that they're worried about their gender is akin to children being experimented on in Nazi I, concentration afraid, camps. I'm, I'm afraid I am, because Lupron, which is, which is um, a drug that's supposed to be meant for end-stage cancer treatment, uh, prostate cancer treatment, is being given to okay, young girls. These hey Graham, not every cancer treatment is as tough as chemo. This is actual medicine, not a class on script writing by Tommy Wiseau. I did not read the study. I did not read it. I did not. That's a bad joke, wow. But obviously I would be amiss if I presented these puberty blockers as perfectly fine medications. They are, after all, pretty strong medications, and they do have side effects. And that's where the rub is regarding safety. Are these side effects acceptable or not? So let's dig into them. And this is the part of the video where I wish I had a smoking gun, but that's not how science often works. There are, unfortunately, a lot of unknowns. But that is not necessarily a bad thing. Most scientific studies will not do a comprehensive, holistic view of how medicine works, the effect of side effects, long-term consequences. Oftentimes, studies will focus on a very narrow field. And that is the data that we have. Various narrow slices. And if you only look at one of those slices at a time, 
it can feel like there are a lot of unknowns, and therefore we shouldn't take any risks. But if you ask people who do this sort of thing for a living, they'll mostly tell you that many of the risks are a bit overblown. But they do exist, and that's important to grant too. Some people object to the use of puberty blockers for health reasons, and sometimes they do have a point. So let's dig in to those points. Let's start with a very common objection to puberty blockers, that it makes your bones fragile. There are some studies that have mentioned that without the flow of a normal puberty, bones and muscles don't grow as strong as they would otherwise. This is because sex hormones usually accelerate the growth of muscles and bone and sinew. But the vast majority of those studies also say that this only really happens in long-term use of these puberty blockers. That is because bone grows very slowly. <laughs> and many of the people who do use puberty blockers are not going to use them for as long of a time where it becomes a problem. But that's not to say that some won't. Looking at the long-term effect, there is some reduced bone density, but this is something that you can fix very easily by using a very complicated scientific method known as checking in. As part of the healthcare package that you're getting into when you start getting into trans-related healthcare, means that you're going to talk to doctors who will check up on your bones to make sure that they're developing healthfully. And if there is an issue with bone density, your doctor can deal with that as well. And one of the ways to deal with that might be to stop the puberty blockers. And that's just because sometimes puberty blockers are not going to be worth the risk. In addition to this, bone growth is actually expected to slow down on blockers. And many studies don't actually track the effect of what happens to bone growth after starting a puberty, be that natural or via hormone replacement therapy. This becomes a problem because, as we know, bones grow more during puberty. But a delayed puberty will also mean a delayed bone density growth, which is normal. And we can see this in a study about cisgender girls, who simply began puberty at different ages. And we can see that those who begin puberty later also have reduced bone density than the norm. There are also some questions regarding cognitive development. Again, many unknowns. Some early studies have claimed that short-term use has been conclusively known to not affect cognitive development, but long-term effects are still unknown. One study from 2017 claimed that there were no effects on cognition due to these medications, but there might be some signs of damaged cognition in animal studies. And while that's not a great sign, it's worth mentioning that children are not sheep. You'd think that this would be enough to do more testing, but that's sometimes impossible to do. That's because there's no way to do control groups here. This is a critical topic for transgender youth and their families. It is also a difficult topic to study because we would never randomly assign transgender youth to treatment and no treatment groups. That would be harmful and unethical. So while there are unknowns, this is as much as we can know at this stage. And what we know from that 2017 study seems to indicate that it's fine. But it should be said that every single study after that one has not had any conclusive evidence about cognitive development. That's not to say that it has a negative effect. It also means that it hasn't had a positive effect. It means we don't know. But it also means that throughout the entire time when people have been using these medications, nothing has come up to indicate that they have an effect on cognitive development at all. Because remember, it's not just trans children using these medications. There's also a question about fertility. These medicines do prevent the production of sex cells, cells that are needed to produce the miracle of life. And the idea is that if you, as a child, take these medications, you're not going to be fertile anymore. And obviously that can be a pretty big deal because you might want children in the future. But here's the thing, these medications are reversible. There may be some slight effect to fertility, which obviously isn't great, but that's also why in many cases doctors will ask patients to cryogenically freeze sex cells before starting puberty blocking treatment. Because one of the earliest stages of puberty is developing those uh, cells. That means taking eggs and taking sperm and sticking them in a freezer. 
Stages in puberty are classified according to something called the Tanner Scale, and it's only after Tanner Stage 2, around age 12, when children can even be prescribed puberty blockers to deal with gender dysphoria. This is because gender dysphoria in children can sometimes resolve itself, but if it remains after this stage, it is often permanent. This means that puberty blockers are only prescribed in stage 3, the same stage where sex cells are produced, but just before most secondary sexual characteristics develop. In this way, fertility is preserved even in the eventuality that these medications would adversely affect your fertility, which they don't. But this leads me to the final argument, that doctors are experimenting on children. I mean, if we don't know the effects, aren't we just testing these on kids, seeing what happens. We, I mean, we don't know what's going to happen. It's, it's a mystery, isn't it? We have no, we have no idea. Children are uh, basically being experimented on with uh, uh, puberty blockers. It's, it's, a, it's a moral panic. We're experimenting on children. It's just like the Nazis. Ugh. These comparisons annoy me quite a lot but I do see where they're coming from. If you don't have a clear and simple answer about both the short and long-term effects of a medication on a child, but you're still prescribing it to them, you could see why some people would think it would be tantamount to experimentation, especially if you were under the impression that these medications are brand new. And it should be said that in the case of prescribing it, to block the onset of puberty because of transgender reasons is something that is moderately new, these medications are not. These medications have been around for over several decades. Also, why would doctors experiment on kids? I feel like this argument is often stemmed from a very American view of the pharmaceutical system, where pharmaceutical companies will do anything to make money out of their patients, which is true, but trans children are a minority of a very small minority, and if you wanted to make money, they'd probably just convince us that opium helps cure depression. Which, uh... <laughs> this is despite, as I've already mentioned, these medications being as tested and as ethically secured as they can be. Anything else would require actual experimentation on children, which would be unethical. In addition to this, it's also really important to mention that every single medication has side effects. There's not a single medication in the world that doesn't have any side effects. The trick is, though, to be able to monitor, track, and contain them. If you're taking a powerful medicine, you're going to have to talk to your doctor fairly often. Even me, just taking my normal hormone replacement therapy, have to go to the hospital and give blood samples at least once a year so that they can make sure that my bones are okay. Instead, we judge which medications are worth the risk of side effects and which medications aren't. The ones who aren't, aren't given to patients. And even with all of these concerns dealt with, there is still no overarching rule for how to deal with trans children, so to say. That sounded really ominous. There's no one rule for how to treat trans children, in the sense of there's no one rule how to treat anyone. That's why you have to talk to a lot of doctors before they will give you your medication, because they have to figure out if you, specifically you, are going to benefit from the medication that you're taking. And that goes for children too. That means that under the same rule set, different children are going to receive different treatment depending on what they need. And that is something that is decided by doctors and counselors and experts in the field. Some children might just want a few months to figure things out, while other children might feel so mentally unwell by the prospect of undergoing a biological puberty that they need this medication to stay mentally healthy. And because gender dysphoria varies from person to person, the effects of puberty blockers will also vary in their effectiveness, because they're effectively treating different things. Every child is, after all, unique. A small child from God. And it's also important to mention here that puberty blockers are not the same thing as hormone replacement therapy. Puberty blockers, on their own, do not cause a transition. They merely inhibit the natural transition that a puberty would cause. And it doesn't stop it entirely. It slows it down. Sometimes by up to 95%, but that's it. Puberty will still happen, just smaller. And these medicines are often less prescribed than what people think. 
I think a lot of parents of trans children will be very concerned by the existence of puberty blockers, thinking that it is a gateway into transness, but oftentimes it just gives children time, and they can stop them, and they can go their entire teenagehood on puberty blockers and at the very end decide that no, it's not for me. I don't want to do it. <laughs> I think this anxiety comes from a study that sees 98% of those who finish their puberty blocker regimen to go on to transition beyond that. The fear is that this means that children are being shuttled into transition. This is despite the alternative explanation, that those who end up not being trans simply stop taking the medication early, or never reach the threshold to be prescribed them in the first place. Since that can take several years, oftentimes the only ones who wait that entire time and finish their entire regimen will be those who actually are trans. This is a sign that people aren't being shuttled in, that the filter, so to say, is working. And even then, you can drop out before transitioning, because puberty blockers don't actually cause any sort of biological transition to happen. For that to happen, you need to take cross-sex hormones or hormonal replacement therapy. And that typically only happens at the age of 16 whether you've been on puberty blockers or not. And you know what? You'd think that answers a question. Puberty blockers are mostly safe, pretty much fine, on par with most medication. But hang on, that leaves us with a lot of questions. Why are puberty blockers in the news so much? Why are there court decisions? Why are states trying to ban it? Why is there an outrage? You'd think from all of the chaos that there has been a recent study that says that puberty blockers turns children into orange goo, but that hasn't happened. So what's the deal? And for that, we need to take a bit of a step back to become a bit more philosophical. Happy those early days when I shined in my angel infancy. Before I understood this place, appointed for my second race, or taught my soul to fancy aught but a white celestial thought, when yet I had not walked above a mile or two from my first love, and looking back at that short space, could see a glimpse of his bright face when on some gilded cloud or flower my gazing soul would dwell an hour, and in those weaker glories spy some shadows of eternity. That is a poem by Henry Vonnen, one of my favorite Welsh philosophers. My only favorite when Welsh philosopher, to be honest. So let's get philosophical for a moment. What is a child? When you think about it, what definitively is a child? Culturally, a lot of us view childhood as being a sacred, innocent moment in a person's life. Most of us have been children, and we think back on this time as a time of purity, innocence, joy. So it makes sense that we see children in this way too, as innocent little babies of God's love. But what does that mean in practice? How do we define a child? Well, legally, in many countries, a child is defined as anyone under the age of 18. That is the line that we have set. Anyone above is an adult, anyone below is a child. But there are obviously some gray areas. In some areas, for example, you are an adult, but you're not allowed to drink. In some areas, you're allowed to drive before you're allowed to vote. So many of us have already accepted that there is a sort of fluidity of childhood. And it should be said that the 18 years old is not a biological marker at all. It is purely an arbitrary choice. 18 is only the age of majority in the US because the Vietnam War drafted people as young as 18, at a time when the age of majority was actually 21. And due to outrage, the age was lowered, because if someone is old enough to die in a war, they're old enough to have political power, at least so went the argument. The stories for why 18 is the norm is unique for every country, but even this age is not a hard and fast rule. In some US states, you can only drink alcohol after you're 21, while in other states, you can get married as young as 14. The barrier of adulthood means basically nothing beyond what we decide it means. 
You could argue that a child is anyone who is not a fully developed adult. But in biological terms, that can go as long as the age of 25. That's because while the body finishes growing around the age of 19 or 20, the mind, the brain soup, continues to grow until you're 25. Which means I only recently became an adult, but almost all of us get to drink before then, vote, join the military, things that are seen as permanent life decisions. So we have already argued that a certain type of underdevelopment is okay. We are allowed to not be fully formed, but have agency. We'll come back to that one in a bit. Meanwhile, let's have a history lesson. Did you know for a long time in human history, the category of child didn't actually exist? It's actually as late as the 1600s when we as a society starts categorizing children as a separate social class from the rest of us. Before then, a lot of times children were just seen as immature adults who haven't learned how to be adults yet. Until the 17th century, people didn't really view childhood as a separate stage in life. One that you enter and one that you leave when you become an adult. But even before we saw child as a social category, people still understood that children are not the same as adults. They are not as mature, which has led cultures and societies to set arbitrary lines of where they think a child is mature enough to be an adult. And for a long time, that age was 12, right at the beginning of puberty. This was, for example, English common law, that children at the age of 12 were mature enough to understand the world around them to the extent where they could join the military, own houses and businesses, and go on out into the world as a fully formed adult. Sure, a child grows up to become an adult, but the phase of a child is seen as a purely transital one. But today, our view of children is different. Today we view children as innocent, requiring care and protection up until the age of 18. And to be fair, a lot of people still describe themselves as children into their early or mid-twenties. The reason for this change is primarily practical. A change in childhood mortality. For a long time in history, childhood mortality was extraordinarily high, which means you gotta have a ton of kids to make sure that at least some of them make it into adulthood. But that also meant that childhood was seen as a brutal survival, a trial of time and age and disease. And if you made it to an adult, chances were that you would probably live a long, healthy life. But a lot of children just died as kids. After the Industrial Revolution, though, people started having less kids because kids began to survive. Childhood mortality dropped. But then we also began to value those children more. And people started thinking, what does it mean to be a child? If childhood is no longer this grueling gauntlet of pain and suffering and survival, what is childhood? There have been many theories about what defines a child at this point. The philosopher John Locke especially has become very influential, describing what he called the tabula rasa, the blank slate of a child's mind. His theory was basically, a bit oversimplified, that a child is born into the world completely blank, and that we, as adults, have to imprint a good, wholesome individual upon this child. But this also meant that if the child was corrupted, or damaged somehow during this innocent phase of childhood when they are so vulnerable, that will damage them for life. And to be fair, there's something to be said for that. But this view also robs children of their agency. The idea that children have a mind of their own, that they are individuals. That becomes lost. This doesn't just change children, it also changes parenting because parenting used to be to take care of a child and make sure that they become an adult. But if a child is a blank slate that can't think for itself, you, the parent, now has to start thinking on their behalf. You have to start becoming their mind and their decision maker, something that a lot of kids probably aren't super happy with. There's also more burden placed on individual parents. Historically, the nuclear family didn't exist. In the sense of two parents and a child, 
children were often raised by the extended family and villagers around you. It wasn't just your parents who raised you. It was literally a village. And you could argue that this is fine. That parents should have the final say of their children no matter what. And to a point, I would agree with you. But only to a point. A common argument against children receiving puberty blockers is the idea that children shouldn't be allowed to make permanent decisions about their own health. But this has some negative implications. Most countries let children have at least some agency over their own health care, and for good reason. The UK, for example, has a system that deals with this called Gillick competence. To judge whether or not a child under the age of 16 is fit to consent to healthcare options without parental knowledge or support. This involves the patient understanding the risks involved and the consequences of that healthcare option. An alternative to this, though, would be a system that doesn't let children have agency over permanent life decisions, such as abortion, vaccination, choosing a life saving healthcare option that a parent might refuse. If we grant all of that power to parents, it also opens up for a significant amount of abuse. Any alternative could also technically break the Convention of the Rights of the Child from the UN, so that's fun. Typically, this is left to the discretion of doctors, who understand the risks involved and who can make an individual assessment of the child. But that might change. And that change means that this healthcare option is not something that can be decided between a doctor and a patient, but the rather by the government. The overarching point that I'm making here is that the category of child is fluid, and that it isn't something that is set in stone, which is something that a lot of people who are talking about puberty and puberty blockers don't really talk about. To them, children are this innocent, perfect being who can't think for themselves. This leads us to talk about trans children. There's currently a conspiracy theory going around in some circles that claim that, for some reason or another, the trans lobby want to trick children into thinking that they are trans. The reasons for this vary. Some say that the pharmaceutical company is doing it to make money. Some say that it is the sexual predation of trans people uh, trying to indoctrinate and trick people into their cult. Um, all of which is obviously conspiratorial BS. I think that this comes from a relatively recent shift in how doctors approach trans people. Historically, there have been three methods of dealing with trans people from the medical community. Historically, one of them has been corrective, meaning that a trans person comes to a doctor, says that, hello, I would like to transition, please, and the doctor will say, no, you don't, and immediately begins some kind of procedure to fix them. Something that's today a bit more known as conversion therapy. That's fallen out of practice, thank God. But there's also been the deterrent or resistance model. This model builds on the idea that if someone is truly trans, then they will fight for their lives to transition. So it doesn't matter what sort of hinders that the doctors put in front of them, a true trans person will do it all in stride to show their worth as a good, perfect little trans. That's relatively more modern. And this is where methods known as real-life experience come in, where gender expression become important in diagnostics. I myself did a large part of my transition in that type of approach. I had to do real-life experience, where you live as your gender for a full year. And if I would go to my doctors wearing pants, they would basically write in their little notes that I wasn't really dedicated. The doctors would enforce a gender norm. And while I wanted to dress like the cave goblin that I usually am, in a tank top and pants like a normal person, but whenever I went to talk to my doctor, I would basically be forced to wear dresses and frilly tops and put on makeup and wear heels because that is what they expected from me. And that is what a good trans would do if they are really trans. Recently though, they've started to adopt the sort of affirmative model, where a patient will come to you, say, hello, I would like to transition, please, and the doctor will go, yes, let us help with that. There's a fear here, lingering from the resistant model, that if someone simply believes that they are trans, erroneously, they will be tricked into going through with transitioning. 
without any sort of pushback, the patient will never know that there may be some other health issue lying around. But this is, lies on a very deep misunderstanding about how trans healthcare typically works. Even in the affirmative model, there are many, many mental health examinations. They will try to find out if there is another issue going on. If you are delusional, for lack of a better term. But the affirmation model has become more prevalent because it reduces distrust between patients and doctors, which is critical if you want to give proper care. And it has also been shown to lead to better results. Because it turns out, when you don't distrust your patients on everything, they actually turn out to be happier. Which is the goal of a transitioning. And it is also the goal of not transitioning, mind you. So if a child comes and says, hello, I am transgender, and they eventually found out that they're not, that is also something that works in the affirmative model. The affirmative model does not say you are trans. It says, we believe you. Here are the tools that will help you think about it. Another aspect of where this fear is coming from is the meteoric rise in new applicants to trans healthcare clinics. If this was a natural evolution, you would think that it wouldn't be so pronounced. Oh god, the world is ending! Several thousand percent increase. The clinics are being swarmed. This sudden rise means that it's unnatural. It is not actual, real transness that is happening here. Thankfully, this has been debunked. But the fear still lingers. The fear that this rise is unnatural. Others have pointed out that there has been a similar curve in regards to left-handedness, for example. That left-handedness became more common after people stopped trying to correct it. In the Swedish healthcare system after 2013, there is a meteoric rise in new applicants to the trans healthcare system. But a lot of skeptics of this rise forget that in 2013, Sweden removed the requirement of forced sterilization, which has a deterrent or resisting effect. And once that's gone, more people will want to do it. Turns out a lot of people don't want to be sterilized. Connected to this fear is the idea that children don't know what's best for them. That they will see trans people in media or on YouTube and think, oh, that's cool, I should do that too. But this is just an extension of the idea that children can't think for themselves. That children are easily manipulated. And to be fair, they are. I'm not arguing for a return to the idea that children are just small adults. If anything, I think that kids should be kids. But I do think that we shouldn't completely discount the idea that children do have a mind of their own and that they do have ideas and thoughts that may be independent. I mean, it doesn't really make sense from any viewpoint in regards to puberty that a child who is 17.9 years old should not have any rights regarding transitioning, and then a day later, if they turn 18, they somehow become self-aware and can think for themselves. Childhood is, for lack of a better word, a bit of a gray area, and medicine has to take that into account. Which is why, as I mentioned earlier, every single child is unique. And every single evaluation has to be made on a case-by-case -case basis. But even setting all of that aside, let's say that the concerns being raised are completely correct. That there is an unnatural rise. Then we would also see an unnatural and also unproportional rise of detransitioners. People who have chosen to transition and then gone back. So let's talk about that. So I want to say, getting into this chapter, that detransitioning is a perfectly fine thing to do. In many cases, it is also very easy. There are only a few trans-related procedures that are not reversible. While most people picture detransitioning, like undoing surgery, for many it can be as simple as stopping a social transition that has nothing to do with medical intervention at all. Or pausing your hormone therapy. Not everything is about surgery. And it's not a worst case scenario as many think, a case of total regret. For some, it is the right thing to do, and some feel comfortable having transitioned and then detransitioned. And for others, detransitioning, or at least the possibility of it, can be reassuring. 
In fact, it was the possibility of detransitioning that actually gave me the guts to transition in the first place, because I figured that even if it is a phase, I'll have some fun. I decided that I would rather be happy by accident than miserable on purpose. So I decided to transition. And if I didn't like it, I could leave. Just walk out. If it sucks, hit the bricks. Just so happened I haven't quit yet. And there are also options to detransition partially or temporarily, whatever suits you best. There's no wrong answer when it comes to transitioning, but this focus on detransitioners gives a false perspective of proportion. You'd think that people were detransitioning en masse, leaving the trans cult, but that's not what we're seeing. Recent studies on detransitioning are few and far between. There have been a few, and there has been a rise in recent years. However, there hasn't been a proportional change. More people have chosen to transition, but a similar proportion of those have chosen to detransition. There hasn't been a disproportionate rise in detransitioners, which means there hasn't really been a trend of people being tricked into becoming trans and then realizing their mistake. It's a similar proportion as always. But it should be said that only an extraordinarily low minority of people who transition choose to detransition. And it's also a very small minority of them who detransition because transitioning wasn't right for them. Other causes for detransitioning vary from pressure from family, discrimination in the work, no social support net, going back into the closet, or detransitioning temporarily. Many who detransition re-transition. That's not to say that it can't be tragic, or that transitioning back and forth is easy. Transitioning can be very hard, and sometimes dramatic. This is why there are safeguards, and why it can take years of evaluation before any prescriptions, and why specialists are involved in that evaluation. When trans people are critical of the healthcare system, it's mostly about waiting times, where no meeting or evaluation happened anyway or outdated forms of evaluation, like real-life experience, because those things don't actually safeguard against anything. They just slow things down. But there's no amount of safeguarding that can prevent every single detransitioner, because there are many people who fit all of the criteria, people who are utterly convinced, people who are perfect examples of a trans person, who might want to detransition for one reason or another, because again, Every patient is unique. And if we do decide to put safeguards in, we have to decide what those safeguards are. Because if we put too many safeguards, we risk excluding people who actually are trans. And then we're causing more harm than good. Medical safeguards are, after all, a game of reducing the risk as much as possible. But you can never eliminate it. Except for one type. A type that is unfortunately often espoused by very extreme anti-trans activists banning trans healthcare all together. If no one can transition, no one's gonna detransition. But remember, the vast majority of people who transition stay transitioning. And so if you're saying that you would want these safeguards to ban healthcare entirely, you're also saying that you would rather have more people suffer than few, which doesn't make any sense. Unless, of course, you think trans people are worth less. So, if the science is in, why do we keep talking about this over and over and over again? I've mentioned this in previous videos, talking about trans healthcare and trans history, but I've never really come to a cohesive answer, because it changes week to week, it seems. While the recent push against trans rights by actual transphobic people, it seems that trans children have become a target. Which unfortunately brings me to one of the darkest news, because if there's one thing that we can all agree on is we want children to be happy and healthy. That should be a common goal of everyone. And it turns out that the number one indicator for whether or not a trans child is happy is not really access to trans healthcare or puberty blockers or anything else healthcare related. It is family support, by far. The science here is actually much clearer than in any other field I've talked about so far. Look at that graph, I love a clear graph. It's also clear in study after study after study. There's no unknowns here. So even if you don't believe in puberty blockers or even transness in general, you should still support your child. 
because, as the science says, any alternative is most likely to cause more harm than good. But I can see why some people would get the impression that the risks of supporting your child are greater than they are, considering headlines and studies are reported as if the danger is far greater than it actually is. There's also definitely a lack of media science literacy here. When those articles get reported, the nuance goes away. And finally, a lot of the criticism that is being levied against trans healthcare completely ignores that these medications aren't new. That cis children and cis adults have been given these medications for years, with no controversy. In fact, cis people receive these medications far more than trans children do. So if there is any risk with these medications, shouldn't they be present in cis children as well? It feels like much of the concern raised here is only around trans children. I wonder why that is. <sighs> so here we are, at the ending. And what have we learned? Are puberty blockers safe? Yes, as safe as any medication can be. Which is to say, yeah, mostly. There is no such thing as a perfect medication. Even aspirin can kill you. That question isn't interesting, but the question as why it is being asked in the first place is. So this isn't really a scientific issue. But there are some things that I want to make clear over all other things. First, I do want to encourage you to see the science for what it is and use it to advocate on the behalf of children, these medications and the procedures that make sure that they get it, or not, are there to protect them, and to make sure that they are the healthiest that they can be. But in the spirit of that, one of the number one indicators for the welfare of a child is parental support. Not necessarily parental encouragement. I'm not telling anyone here to push their kids to become trans. God no, that's also bad. But rather to listen to your children. They will tell you what they need. You can take care of them, but you can't think on their behalf. And disregarding the medicine entirely, family support matters far more than any medication could when it comes to child welfare. So even if you are skeptical about puberty blockers, and even if you are skeptical about transness in general, try to put that aside and focus on what would make your child happier. And science shows that by far, you supporting them will make that happen. And finally, there are a lot of unknowns. There could be long-term consequences to these medications that could matter, that could require adjustments within the healthcare system. That could happen. Most likely, it will happen, as will happen in every single sector of healthcare, as new science and medicine are being developed. But we can't dictate our lives based on unknowns especially when the scientific consensus is clear that the risks are small and, crucially, manageable when they're not. When researching these topics, I think it's important sometimes to take a step back and think about what's really important. Because while there might be some risks and while there might be some controversy, there is something that we can all agree on. That children should be happy and supported. And that means, on occasion, to listen to your child. They often know themselves a lot better than anyone else can. And that can be difficult. But the initial step is listening. And finally, don't try to keep up with every single study that comes out. Many of these studies are flawed. I'll be honest, when I started making this video, I thought that puberty blockers were more dangerous than they in fact are. I thought that this would be a video on grey areas, but when it comes to the science, the science is in. But I had to do a lot of research to do that. I had to go through many scientific articles and consult friends and scientists who can know how to decipher that. Um, it's very difficult. <laughs> and uh, I do this as my job now, right? I, I, read, I read stuff and I tell you what I've read. I do a book report. Uh, but you don't have to do that. You shouldn't have to do that. And all that is pretty difficult, but you know, I enjoyed learning something. And I'm sure that you do too. But you might not want to dig into scientific articles every single week. That can be a bit archaic and difficult. Maybe you want to learn something a bit more approachable. Which brings me to my sponsor of this video, Skillshare. 
I'm not getting better at these segues. Skillshare is an online learning platform for thousands of people who want to explore their own creativity. Most lessons are under 60 minutes, so they can fit most schedules and won't take months of work like the research I had to do with this one. This month, I want to recommend Artivism by Nicholas Smith because I like putting my creative energy into making these videos and hopefully changing someone's mind once or twice. And if you want to do a similar thing, this course is a great way to learn to do that. Skillshare is curated specifically for learning, so there are no ads. But the first 1,000 of my subscribers who clicks the link in my description will get one month free access of Skillshare Premium Membership. So, you know, get out there and learn. Thank you so much for watching that video. If you like this video and you would like to see more, please click like, subscribe, do the things that YouTubers say that you should do. Um, and if you like my content so much that you want to support me financially, you can go to Patreon and help me there, because that helps pay my bills. And you get access to streams, um, and you get uh, to hear my lovely voice thanking you in the credits, maybe, depending on what you do there. <laughs> With that said, I want to thank everyone for watching this video, I want to thank my patrons for supporting me to make this video, and I want to give a special thanks to... Alex Glass, Alice Wells, Alicia Crawford, Amanda B, Amy Lee, Andy Sophia Fontaine, Ashley Kitchen, Aster Disaster, Athiette, Austin K, Autumn, Bill Kennedy, Cara Rudolph, Catherine Stenson, Christine Gutierrez, Cobra Sphere, Dana Ferguson, D. Mirandi Acerato, Ella, Emil Lutkowski, Emilia Clark, Emily Lynn, Erich Owens, Phelan, Fox Kant, Hannah Richards, Henry R. Seymour, Jane Lusby, Janelle Torgerson, Jareth Arnold, Jay Parker, Jane the Human, Jess, Jill Isabel Meyer, the one and only Stephanie Sterling, JKL, Jürgen Danielsen, Joshua Analik, Julia Helene, Jurassic X Bark 7, LPQ Silver, Linus Tvopiknoll, Luca Bernecke, Lyra Wardrill, Madison Jacob, Marcus Smith, Maurizio, Mia, Michaela, Morimer, Nia Pasaka, Nyef, Nyefbun, you'd think I know how to pronounce that, but I'm sorry. Pat, Rose Brunton, Rose H, Riley Knox, Salmon Moose, Sean Stringer, Silent, Sitzries, Sophia Razan, Sonic Bread, Thoros of Mirror, Tiffany A, William Fuhussel, Vivian Crow, Wolfgang the Grand High Exalted Wizard, YHL, and Zoya Kant. Thank you. I'll have you know those are 69 individual names. Nice.